we take our time and take care of our health because if we aren't healthy within ourselves, how can I show up healthy in a relationship? If you look at like the age in which we're in, some people feel like, well, as long as you have a roof over your head, as long as you have a little money in the bank account and you're healthy, what do you have to stress Sometimes about? Sometimes you feel like you're good, like, oh, I'm good. I don't like, I would go to these sessions and not have anything to share. It would be like, oh, how was your week? My week was great. I did X, Y, and Z. I'm like, all right, cool. There go 150 bucks, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, everybody? You're now tuning into a special conversation today. My name is Christian. I'm the founder of Off the Cuff. And today we're here with some phenomenal entrepreneurs, creators, dreamers, influencers, but more importantly, community leaders. Um, I'm thankful today we're going to be launching the I Am Project in collaboration with Brooklyn Cloth. And we're going to be having some real conversations, conversations around mental health, self-affirmation, self-love and most importantly, how important it is to build community along the way. So with every conversation that we set and we do, we love to set the intent for the conversation, right? So I wanna go around the room really quick to state who you are and the intention for this conversation that you have, wanna have today. So Joe, we'll start with you. Sure, um, I'm Joe, I'm actually from Brooklyn Cloth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think I'm the only non-influencer here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm actually been with Brooklyn Cloth for going on eight years. Uh, I'm also a dad, a husband, and I think the intent is just to get to know everyone here, get to know who you are, share a little bit about me and my story. So super honored that you even asked me to, to be part of this conversation um, and then just share like what it's like. Yeah. Feel free to drop in. We can either go oh, this okay. way. Okay. Oh, right, right. Oh, my God. Okay. This is me. Wait, you wearing popcorn? You wearing popcorn? You got to fix somebody at home. I guess I'll go next. Um, I'm Valentina. I've been content creating for close to nine years now. And a lot has shifted in the last three to four years, especially with the pandemic and just going through a lot of life changes and understanding that I couldn't become the person that I was advocating for on social without taking care of my mental health and who I am genuinely as a person. And with that, I feel that the intent for this conversation should be just honesty and, and realness and just being your truest self and showing up for who you genuinely are. What up, y'all? I'm Jamerson. Um, man, I got to like give a spiel about who I am, huh? Man, I do stuff. So I <laughs> creative things, hosting, art, design, fashion. All that you know, kind of encompasses in my life, but I feel like at times we can get so based on like what we do instead of who we are. So my intention is to just let the spirit do what it wants to. Like, I'm not here to big up what I do as a creative or big up what I do as an individual, but just like really get to the depths of our heart. And hopefully, whoever watches us talk today and hears what I have to say, maybe it'll touch somebody who's going through the same things that I've been going through. So that's really my intentions. Hi, uh, I'm Nioma. I'm a storyteller and host. And I think my intention today is just to be present and appreciate this moment that we're all sharing to just be people from different walks of life connecting and vibing. And I hope that everyone that's watching this feels like they're here with us. And I hope that we just have an amazing conversation really and just connect. Amazing. Um, my name is Hector Espinal. I am the co-founder of We Run Up Town. Um, I'm a community leader. And uh, my intention today is to uh, get inspired by everyone's mental health journey. And uh, uh, hopefully that inspires me to continue the work that I'm already doing. Hey everyone, I'm Liz B. Croft. I am a licensed therapist and I'm the founder of Mental Sesh, which is my private practice. And it's also a brand where we do fun collaborations and partnerships, consulting, activations where we kind of connect the dots within sports, entertainment, and mental health. Um, and in my private practice, I primarily work with pro athletes, entertainers, and creatives as a therapist. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with everyone. And my intention is to use my expertise to help in whatever ways I can, but most importantly, listen to what everyone else is sharing and bringing to the table and learn from all of you as well. That's beautiful. You know, and I think, you know, going around the room, there's a common theme here, right? And it's, of course, it's the mental health. And I think I want to dive into that conversation a little bit more, right? And uh, I kind of want to start with you, Valentina, because you kind of started through the journey of, like, being able to um, 
show your true authentic self, you know, especially on the screen. What was your first experience with mental health and when did you realize that that was actually something you needed to focus on? I think I initially realized I needed to focus on it when I met Liz. <laughs> and no, in, in all honesty, she was my only friend that I knew that was a therapist and this was her practice. And just like in the little doses that she introduced what mental health was and why it was so important to just anything that you do in life, the way you show up, the conversations that you have with people, you don't do it until you realize, okay, I have the free will of showing up to therapy and making sure that I'm taking care of myself. And I think that was the catalyst of understanding I'm not a perfect human being, we're all not perfect. And just doing the work and, and realizing you're always changing, you're always a work in progress and no one is here to judge you. Hopefully they can accept who you are while you're the work in progress. And yeah, just constantly working on that and then bringing along your community and having them understand that we're all works in progress and we can't point fingers or, or say who's perfect, who's not perfect, who's doing the, it the right way or the wrong way. And that was one of the reasons why I felt showing my authentic self to my community is important, but addressing the situation with myself first is my priority. I love that. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in on just their mental health journey and Man, shoot, my mental health journey, I'm gonna tell you exactly what happened. I woke up one day and heart was just, sorry, I know I'm slapping this thing, but literally just beating out my chest and it was just doing this for like weeks. And I'm like, okay, I'm either, oh, and I was having panic attacks. So I was at work having the panic attacks, had to go in the bathroom, was losing my breath, couldn't, couldn't catch it. And I was like, okay, this isn't, isn't a normal thing. Like before that, I probably had it, but probably was either covering up with something or using something to kind of like, like treat it, that's not actually what you need to do, like go to therapy, learn, learn coping mechanisms, learn tools. But mine started by just literally having panic attacks and realizing like, yo, this isn't okay. And then I was going to church at the time, like, yo, you should probably see a therapist. So they linked me up with um, a therapist from a sister church. And then that was my therapy journey. I think I started in 2016, 2017. I mean, still going to therapy to this day. So it's like, like she said, it's a process. Like it's, I feel like sometimes when I talk to people about therapy, A, it's a, stigma, it's a stigma in black community. Like you go to therapy, then like, like really it's like you insane or something wrong with you. Like if you talk to like our parents who was a generation before us, like they're, everybody's mental, everybody's but like, yeah, like there's so many things going on this, on this planet, on this earth, traumas from childhood, childhood traumas, things that we've been through. And now it's like you're an adult and you have to face all those things. Like, yeah, we are a little mental. We all need to take our time and take care of our health because if we aren't healthy within ourselves, how can I show up healthy in a relationship? How can I show up healthy for my friends? How can I show up healthy for my community? How can I show up healthy for my job? And how can I know what's healthy and what's not healthy? Because yeah. we get so used to being in toxic patterns, we just think that toxicity is healthy in all like that dysfunction is not okay. You know, so just learn that. And it's been a journey. Like every year is something new, you know, to over overcome. Like this year has been a journey, which I'll probably get into later, of, a new level of mental health, like, oh, I thought I was good, and now mm -hmm. I gotta relearn or use the coping mechanisms I've already learned to get through this new situation, so. That's been I appreciate it, congratulations. I mean, just be, you know, 2016, those years in, man, that's, yeah. that's something to be, you Thanks, know, brother. to congratulate as well. What about this side? How are we feeling on the, on the mental health journey? Um, I think my mental health journey has been I don't even know what to say about it, really, just because it's been up and down and it's been, you've been learning. And um, like you said, like our parents didn't come from that generation. And some of my friends don't really understand it or don't really know or may kind of like judge the idea of therapy. And I think what I've found a lot of people talk about is like, oh, like, yeah, I'll, I'll do therapy, but like another time or I'll eventually get around to it. So I think, you know, some people are waiting for like a panic attack or like a huge breakdown um, before they start, which I think kind of sucks because like, when you get to really uncover what's really going on, you realize like, oh wow, I have a lot more than what I thought I, I was going through or whatever. And I think in my case, um, what happened with me? I think I was like going through things. So it did take a little bit for me to realize like, oh wow, you know, but um, I think the beautiful thing about therapy is that it allows you to kind of like open up your mind to who you really are. I think that we're in a society right now where a lot of us are telling people what to do or we're like ingesting a lot and you know and it's kind of like well how do you feel about that what do you think about that um because again it's like 
if you look at like the age in which we're in, some people feel like, well, as long as you have a roof over your head, as long as you have a little money in the bank account and you're healthy, what do you have to stress about? What do you have to think about? And I just think that with therapy, it's so beautiful because you get a personalized journey for you and you get to live in that. So that's been my mental health journey so far. I feel like it's, it's been up and down, but the beautiful thing is that I'm learning new things about myself every day and I'm embracing it. I'll jump in. Um, my mental health journey started in 2013. Um, and it wasn't me seeking therapy. 2013, I was probably like 21 years old. Um, and the conversation around therapy isn't what it is now. Um, and uh, I, I went through a breakup, I gained a bunch of weight, and I just started to hermit myself. So I was always home and everyone around me was like, oh, you should get out more, you should do this. Um, and that's why I started We Run Uptown. It was really selfish at first. It was me trying to surround myself with people so I can stop being at home and uh, feeling bad for myself. And what I should have been doing was going to therapy, but I used fitness um, as a vehicle for change, at least for myself. And I started working out and I started running. Um, and it wasn't until three months before the pandemic where I realized that I needed to go to therapy. You know, I, my fiance gave me an ultimatum um, and I went and it was amazing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's on and off for me. You know, like Jameson was saying, like, sometimes you feel like you're good. Like, oh, I'm good. I don't like... I would go to these sessions and not have anything to share. It would be like, oh, how was your week? My week was great. I did X, Y, and Z. I'm like, all right, cool. There go 150 bucks, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just sat right. here and said nothing. Um, but then other times it would be like, Yo, no, 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 we're not, we're not done. I still have, like, I, I want to keep talking. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's where I, I currently am right now with my mental health. I love that, man. And thank you so much for all for sharing, because I think it's, it's super important. And we're going to get to like therapy and the outlets and the vehicles that we use um, a little later on, you know, and it's something that I, I want to lean into because it seems like we all go through different ups and downs, right, on a day to day as creatives, as entrepreneurs, as leaders um, in our households, outside our households and stuff. And, you know, when we think about that, right, of, of showing up as your true authentic self and, and doing what you need to do, Sometimes it, things don't always stick, um, you know, and in those moments where you feel like throwing in a towel, when you feel like calling it quits, what do you say to yourself in those moments to keep you going? What are, so, what are some of those self-affirmations that you give yourself each and every day? I usually say that I'm a work in progress, reminding myself that healing is not linear and that, you know, I have the skills to get through the hard times and that the hard times are not always going to be happening. And I've gotten through it, you know, time and time again, and I can do it again. But also trying to find that motivation, I think, is the hardest, is the hardest part. I think I try to, like, embrace my storm and then give myself the tools that I need, whether it's grounding myself, whether it's a last minute trip, whether it's whatever it is. It's like, I think the beautiful thing about, like, letting things happen as it happens is that before you know it you do become better but like putting pressure on yourself to be better right now it actually just creates more anxiety and more worries and things like that so I think just giving myself the space to be and then still remembering at the end of the day like who I am my values because that doesn't change it never changes even if there's like a storm going on it like who you are is still who you are regardless you know so mm -hmm. yeah I think I use um I use this too shall pass, but I also use like live in the mud. Mm -hmm. And what I say by that is like, sometimes I have an argument where I'm like, you're like a pig in mud where you're just in the dark. You gotta be okay with being in the dark mm -hmm. because you have to, you know, if somebody's father died, it's like, I'm so sorry, it sucks. Like you have to say that. And I think that change in mindset in acknowledging if you have a breakup, if you lost a job, if you, whatever that, crappy thing is happening in your life, I'm that friend that will say, yeah, that really sucks. You should be angry. You should be sad. You should whatever versus like, it's okay. There's the light at the end of the tunnel. No, I'm going to be with you and I'll be with you holding your hand saying that it sucks with you. And I think that changes the optics in how, at least for me as I've evolved and how I view my life. Because before it'd be, you know, culturally coming from an immigrant family, from the Philippines, therapy is not this. You, either you pray your fear away or pain away, and then you just move ahead. You have to work, you have to just do good in school, X, Y, Z. But now it's like, you still have to do that, but you can say, 
and acknowledge that you feel whatever you feel. I think one of the biggest things I've taken away from therapy in the last couple of years that I've been doing it is just leaning on your tribe and understanding that there's a community that is rooting for you and is cheering you on. And with so much going on with capitalism moving forward, just constantly on a go, you slightly sometimes forget that there's people behind you that have nurtured you to be who you are and they're a part of your DNA. And I think it's important to allow time to, to work itself out and just give time time. And it took me a little while to understand that because we're so stuck in every moment that we're in that we don't realize nothing's stopping, like everything continues to move. We just, again, have to tap into that willpower to understand where are my outlets and where are the people that I can lean on. I think, again, with it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a tribe to maintain yourself grounded and, and realize, wow, we're all in this together, as cliche as that sounds, <laughs> but we really are all in this together and we're not, we're all doing life differently, but we're doing it together in, in the same essence of time, I, I wanna say, yeah. And for, and for me, it's more so like, in this season that I'm in right now, is A, giving myself grace. So like, a truth that I tell myself is like, yo, give, give yourself grace. Like, especially in, in a rough season, you mentioned, I'm going, like my mom passed away earlier this year. So that's been something I've been dealing with for the last seven months. It's been an up and down roller coaster. Some days I'm super happy, some days I'm sad, some weeks I'm not good, some weeks I'm happy. Sometimes I'm reminded of something and I'll be down. But like for me right now, it's just, just giving myself grace in that. Like, every day is not gonna be perfect. Every day is not always gonna be the same. But be still be gentle with myself during those times. Like I'm fearfully and wonderfully made regardless of what is happening in my situation. And I'm never alone. A, I got my friends, I got my family that's still here. I got my tribe, I got God, I got everybody. So like reminding myself of that. And some days it's easy and some days it's hard. Some days I have to remind myself of that literally from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. And it's like I got to keep reminding myself like I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Like keep on rotating that through my mind. Because if I don't, then I'll allow myself to feel beat up. I'll allow myself to feel down. There's times where you have to feel that. Like you said, like you have to sit in that emotion sometimes too. So there's times where I'll just sit and I'll cry for an hour and a half, two hours, and allow myself to feel that emotion because I can't just cover it up, keep pushing because a year and a half down the line, mm -hmm. come and smack you in the face and you'd be like, bro, what's this emotion? It's the one that you never dealt with. So for me, like, that's really what I'm, I've been on lately is just giving myself grace in, in the time and being gentle and kind and, I mean, sweet to myself, take myself out, do something nice to myself, say something nice to myself, write a, I got a, um, a little chalkboard thing like in my kitchen it says fill fill your mind with good thoughts and good things so it's like filling my mind with whatever is true noble pray like like filling my mind with that every morning and it's helped you know it's not perfect but every day i feel like i'm getting like one percent two percent better that's amazing being comfortable with being uncomfortable yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. I don't like being uncomfortable, though. <laughs> I don't yeah. like being uncomfortable right. and suffering, though. That is the yeah. worst. Nobody does, bro. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm like rubbing my legs. Just, I'm like, yo, I don't like For that. Real. I don't like yeah. that. That's not fun. <laughs> right. I want everything to be roses and, and mm -hmm. sunflowers and parade all the time, bro. Rainbows I do not like suffering, dog. It's, it's so crazy. I mean, you, you, I just love the energy so far, right? Because it's all very truthful. It's all organic. And for me, when I'm thinking about just a lot of themes come up, right? And one of the main things... Uh, we think about uh, self-love, right? How do you give yourself grace? How do you remind yourself that? And when you're in those darkest moments, it's okay to be there. And how do you continue to amplify yourself to get out of those dark spaces? You know, and when, when I was thinking about just my journey of like putting this all together, um, you know, I'm first generation college student, first of my family to graduate high school, you know, and it's just like, oh wow, check the box, right? And then you go through these moments of checking all these boxes and stuff, but you forget to really conceptualize all the trauma you probably have had. And it wasn't until therapy for me about a year and a half ago that I started to really connect all the dots. And I told my therapist when I first walked in, I was just like, I don't know where to start, but I just wanna know that I wanna unlock the, the best potential of myself. I know I'm met for greatness. I don't know how I'm gonna get there, but I just wanna be able to un understand where I'm going and understand who I am. And there was a lot of things that I didn't know how to do. I didn't know how to be by myself. I, you know, I have a big family and stuff. Like, how do I spend time with myself? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, for me, it was always noise, noise, noise. And I still, you know, until I got um, together with my fiance, you know, you always have that one person that keeps you honest. 
and that's her, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I'm so grateful for that because um, it allowed me to grow, to be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and to really step into to, to my purpose now. You know, and you know, Jameson, you speak on uh, a lot of those self practices and outlets that you do, right? Like writing on the board, um, taking yourself out. I'm curious to know, kind of going around the room, like what are some of these other outlets that make you happy or that you feel that you have to do in order for to keep that happiness alive? My appearance is really important. Um, that's something that I've battled with my entire life. I've always been the bigger guy, you know, no matter what group of friends are. I'm a runner now, but I'm still the bigger guy. So I've always like wanted to upkeep how I look, you know, like the haircut, like that's super We're important, clean, bro. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but um, like, I feel like for a lot of guys, that is your, your, and your barber is not a therapist, but that is your first like introduction into having a conversation with someone that is not a part of your, I guess, like your friend group, you know, my barber is not my friend. I've been going to him since I was 14 years old. So I sit down there and like, that relationship with the barber and how I feel when that cape comes off and I look myself in the mirror and he, and he you know, like he puts the top of the, 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 the powder on. Like, you feel good, you feel empowered, you know? And that's something that I like to pass on to my kids. You know, we get, we get haircuts bi-weekly. And like the kids, like you, I, I think about it now, the kids hate going to the barbershop. I used to hate going to the barbershop, but the way they look and the way they feel, you, you, you leave the barbershop feeling brand new. And we used to make this video during the pandemic where me and the boys would jump in there and I'd be like, hombre nuevo, like I felt like a brand new man. Um, you know, getting my nails done, like, uh, like steaming my clothes, like the cologne I wear, like all those things. I know it, it sounds like it's, it's, it's vanity, but if I look good, I feel good, you know? And that's the way that I feel like everyone else perceives me. Like, you know, when you catch me at the supermarket with the sweats, I just pulled out the, 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 the hamper with the, with the wrinkled tee. I don't feel my best, you know? I don't want to bump into Jameson, yeah. you know? <laughs> I'm looking the same yeah. way. So I, <laughs> I want to make sure, like, I leave. But, like, like I, I started this thing called, like, Self-Care Fridays. I was doing it for a while. I fell off a bit. Um, and, like, like my fiance tells me all the time, like, yo, you got to get back to that, you know? Like, you weren't doing that for anyone but yourself. You know, I, w I was going to get, get my nails done, getting my hair cut weekly, um, you know, like, and, and, and doing all these things, uh, facials. I, I didn't know that was a thing, you know? Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, damn. Like, uh, uh, like uh, beauty products for men. Um, so when I started doing all those things, I started to, like, take my time, you know? I have a nightly routine now before I go, you know, like, like free the people, whatever, it's, you know? Like, <laughs> I jump in there and I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm what are they called? What are they called? The rollers? The J rollers, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you pop it out the freezer. What yeah. face toner do you use, by the way? I was using the fancy fat toner for yeah. a minute. Boy, it was Fat water amazing. was amazing, you know, you feel me? Like, yeah, and then I you got would some rose water now, though. Yeah. Yo, yeah. But then you hear it. <laughs> you hear it from people like, yo, Hector, you glowing. Yeah, of course I'm glowing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I spent 40 minutes before I went to bed last night, you know? Like, <laughs> but that's important uh, to me, you know? Like, if you feel good, you look good. Just to jump in really quick, but that that made me realize, remember is like, yo, control what you can. Like, and yeah. like if you can, if I can control my appearance, how I feel, getting my nails done, getting my hair cut, ironing my clothes, make sure I look good. Like, at least, I was just telling my sister, sister this reason, like, yo, at least I feel like I did something. Like, regardless of how the day goes, like, I can look back and say, yo, I took care of myself today. And that helps me feel at least a little bit better, regardless of what happens in the day. It's like, I feel good. So. I've also tapped into working out lately. Um, over the pandemic, I just gained about 40 pounds and I've never ever seen myself in that mirror. I never thought I would get there and it was just kind of like a, a moment in my life where I lost my grandfather and I didn't wanna do anything. I didn't wanna work out. I didn't want to get poured into myself the way I was pouring into others at the time because I realized if I pour into other people, maybe everything will be okay and I won't need to focus in on myself but a year and a half ago, I looked in the mirror and I was like, I don't recognize myself. This is not me. This is not what I advocate for on my platform. Like, who am I? What's happening? And I had to ask my therapist, can you please help me unlock what I've been storing in my body for the last three years? The grieving, the, all the traumas and just understanding this is who I am as a person. What are my outlets? What are my resources that I can use to make myself a better person? And working out has been one of them, like finding new ways that I can mold my body and understand my body, who I am as a person and, and rolling with that. I love that. You know, and 
it's so many different practices that I, I take away from now, and, and I'm sure the audience and, and viewers who are watching this is all going to say, oh, wow, I never really thought about that. Let me get back to the self-care you know, care Fridays and so on and so forth. You know, we are, are all walking in individual journeys, but kind of in a way similar journeys, right? Um, through the ups and, down, ups and downs and all these things um, that we kind of le do on the day-to-day. -day. I'm curious to know, in your journeys right now, when you kind of reflect and look back of where you were and where you are now, do you feel like you can confidently say to yourself, looking in the mirror, that you love yourself? Depends on the day. Yeah. Expand yeah. on that. That's a great answer. You know, I find when I'm in tune with my whole self, not just my mental health, but my physical health, because it really is, you know, something that goes hand in hand. That's when I feel my best. It's not when, I mean, obviously, like, I love being there for other people. It's literally my job. But at the same time, I have to show up first for myself. And if I'm, you know, making, prioritizing nutrition and, like, what I'm putting into my body, exercise, like, making sure I'm, like, releasing any energy that I might need to get out of my system, going to therapy, you know, prioritizing my mental health, prioritizing self-care, surrounding myself with people who uplift me and also who call me out in my shit when I need to be called out. Yeah, that's important. Um, it's, yeah, it's so important. You know, I have a friend that works in pharmaceutical advertising and it's like the best thing. I think all of us being like in the creative, you know, space, having someone that's like so far removed from that is so refreshing because she will right away be like, chill your ego, like mm -hmm. cut the shit. And it's humbling, you know, and I appreciate it a lot. And it took me a while to, you know, be okay with that. but on the time the days where I'm consistently doing that stuff for myself that's when I can look in the mirror and say like you're doing everything you can that's in your power it's in your control um the days where I'm not that's also I you know see the correlation that's when I start feeling like crap about myself that's when the negative thought patterns start to take over my brain that's when you know it's harder to get up in the morning even shower some days so seeing the correlation it seems so simple but putting that all into practice and doing it consistently really does make a difference and it, it impacts just how I see myself, how I see the world around me and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. I feel like uh, that's a loaded question. I think that um, the question of do you love yourself is really interesting. I think I'm less focused on the goal of do I 100% love myself and I'm more focused on the journey of making sure I feel good every day and that I am okay with not looking my best sometimes or okay with not feeling my best or just being this beautiful mess right because to me that's really loving yourself but i think again for me i'm just focused on like the actions and just do i feel good today am i present today does this make me happy and then before you know it with time you will because if you think about it a lot of us are like millennials or like a younger part in our lives and like we have to unlearn so much and then some of us just got in therapy, it's like, how do you want us to, hundred? like it's just so much. So it's like just loving yourself through the journey is just important for me. And you know, being happy to still be here. Cause there's some days, I don't know about y'all, a few days I've been like, do I want to be here anymore? You know, I don't know. But I think that's like the, the main important part for me right now. And like, I think that is a form of loving myself, you know? Yeah, listening to yourself is so important. Cause like, you know, sitting on the couch, binging Netflix, like not showering is self-care sometimes. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Just listening to what you need in yeah. that moment and doing it. Right. Absolutely. I agree. You know, and, and as, as we kind of go through our second theme here, and there's a few themes in here that we already said, but therapy, right? I kind of want to lean into therapy because I feel like we all kind of shared it in our own individual journeys. Um, how has therapy kind of evolved as you evolved? How does those conversations evolve, right? Because the first conversation you have, it's very different from six years in, seven years in, how like, or just in general, right? How has your uh, conversations evolved with your therapist um, along your journey? I think for me, well, I, this is my second therapist. So my first therapist, I went, left, came back, and then like they, he had, he moved. I don't remember what happened, something happened. Got another therapist now. But I just remember when I first started therapy, it was more like, problem focused like oh this is happening this is happening this is happening oh my god this is it now it's more like 
how can I be better within the problem to be okay until this problem or the storm or whatever passes rather than just trying to get out of it. So now it's more like, I guess, solution oriented rather than problem oriented. So now I'm just trying, okay, well, I can't control this. So what can I do? Breathe, rest, and just do the best I can at this time. Or, hey, I need to go have this conversation with this person and I'm not the best at having hard conversations. So let me write out what I need to write out instead of just hoping that the problem goes away is now actively like working with my therapist. Now, if I get a prompt, like, hey, actively working through that prompt so I can feel, be feel better. She gives me a task, actively taking the time to do that task. And then when we get back the next week and she'd be like, yo, dude, I'm like, oh yeah. And you realize how much better I feel rather than when I first started and was just focusing on everything that was going wrong rather than focusing on A, what I can control and B, what can I do to be a part of the solution rather than just magnifying the problem? I think my journey's really, it's, I'm a Gen X, so I'm not a millennial <laughs> or a Gen Z. So in the 90s, like being gay is very different than now. I, I remember like, I was telling my daughter, she's eight, I'm like, you should write a summer journal. And I actually looked back at my journal at 1990, in the 90s and then in the late 90s. I started seeing a therapist in college because I was like, I remember driving home it's raining, it's like an after school special, right? Like immigrant child, parents work, you're a valedictorian, you got into good school, then you're gay. Like it's like, <laughs> oh my God. And like, I remember driving saying, I'm gay. Like I, I'm fucking gay. Like I'm like literally crying saying I'm gay. And then scared that my parents weren't gonna accept me. It's not like that now, I don't think for many. So there is this luxury that a lot of kids have where they're like, they're you know, whether they're gender fluid, whether they're gay, they're bi, they're whatever that is, it's definitely more accepted in the mainstream media. It's definitely more accepted in communities like where we live. That's not how it was for me. So, you know, I was depressed. I was really, I was 100 pounds overweight. And like to the point of like, I just didn't like living. And that question of do you love yourself, I remember my mom asking, saying, do you love yourself? And I broke down and cried and said, I don't. After that cry, she was like, you need to see a therapist. And that's the first time she ever said that. I was a senior in high school. I dropped 100 pounds in six months. Bec and I think it wasn't because I just, I mean, I, it's because I saw a therapist and it allowed me to release. Um, she was a CBT, like a cognitive behavioral therapist at the time. So it's more like coping mechanisms and help. Um, it helped me. Um, I, it was estranged from my family for a while. When they found out I was gay, they told me to pray the gay away. They sent me to the Philippines. They had me live with family members that prayed over me. And the whole time I was like, this is bullshit. And I came back and I left my house. Knowing in the back of my mind, I was saving money the whole time. And so that was then. And then ironically, you know, 25 years later, I, you know, I do, I do therapy. I hate therapy because I don't like living in, in ugly and that's what therapy for me is it's not sunshine and rays and i told you know i tell my therapist like i feel like i'm all over the place she's like you are she's like we are peeling you to put the puzzle back the onion. but you have to yes the like the onion or the puzzle and you know it's one of those moments where you know you invest in yourself to do it but therapy evolves like uh from when you know you're in your teens and 20s to now i'm you know, in my mid 40s, it completely changes. But um, I think it's not easy. Therapy is not easy. Financially, it's not easy for many people. It's a fact. Commitment, it's not easy. And then you ebb and flow. Some days you love your therapist, some days you hate your therapist. And that's transference, right? And ironically, I'm married to a psychotherapist too, so it's, it's another piece of it. But I think therapy is important for anybody that needs it. And when I see someone in pain, it's automatically like, yes, we'll be there for you, but it's like, you know what, you, you might want to get help. And whether that's telehealth, whether there's, you know, there's places where they'll do it based on a sliding scale. So if you're a student, you're going to pay 25 bucks. But they don't know that. And I was fortunate enough to know that when I was in college and then continue. Um, so it just evolves. I think that's one aspect. And the other aspect is kind of like what Valentina said is, like the mental and physical health. So dropping 100 pounds, always being afraid, kind of like what you're saying of how you look, how you feel. So there has to be a balance of that. So that's kind of like where I am right now. 
And I do say that you evolve as you go from your 20s to your 30s to your 40s. It's kind of those funny TikToks where the moms are like, I don't give a shit. I'm going to go and wear this. <laughs> or because it's true, like you really, your priorities about yourself change, but your love and your self-confidence and how you view yourself, it gets better. It really does. And it is, it, it really does for whether you're struggling now or not, you continue to evolve. I love that. You know, it's funny because my therapist, uh, every time, you know, we would have a conversation, um, no script, he would ask me the question, so where do you want to start today? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, I was leaning on you to kick it <laughs> off and stuff. That's your and, job. And I think that's such an important question, right? Where do you want to start? Sometimes we don't have the platform or create a space to talk about these conversations. You know, and, and Liz, you're in a very unique space right now, right? Um, you are a therapist, right? Um, and I'm curious to know, why did you lean into that and what's keeping you there? Yeah, um, so I started my therapy journey in sixth grade. Um, I had a really tough time. I would go away to basketball, sleepaway camps. I played basketball my whole life. And that's when I first learned I had panic attacks and anxiety and I wouldn't be able to even stay over for a weekend without like just hyperventilating, not sleeping. And it was really isolating because my teammates, like my coach, no one really knew what was going on. Like I was kind of like isolated. No one really like knew how to support me or wanted to even be around me. Um, so my parents, you know, decided like, let's get you started with a therapist. And I kind of, at that time, viewed it as a punishment. Um, I have been in and out of therapy for a lot of other reasons as well, like as I, you know, grew and got older. Um, but I did ultimately see how it positively impacted me. Um, I actually wanted to be an orthodontist when I was in college. Um, and then I encountered organic chemistry and realized really quick that was not my path. Um, and my advisor at the time was kind of like, you know, why don't you consider like psychology? Why don't, you know, you have this history of mental health. Like, so I leaned into it and that's kind of what started that journey. But I, I even at that time, wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the psychology degree. And then eventually, you know, after more therapy and a really bad breakup in college, um, I, that was my turning point. I was like, okay, I want to be able to help other people. So, yeah, it's all, I'm always growing as a therapist. Like, when I even started grad school, I really thought I wanted to do hospital therapy, you know, and, and work in a hospital. And um, then I kind of shifted that perspective after reflecting on just my experiences growing up as an athlete and learning how coaches and sometimes other people don't have the understanding of, you know, how to support, you know, the mental health components to sport. Um, and that's kind of then what helped me pivot into my career now working with athletes. Um, but also just, you know, I really like being a therapist and I, I think too, therapy does get a bad rap at times and it's really hard to find a therapist that's a good fit for everyone. Um, you know, there's stereotype. Everyone has a clipboard and a cardigan, and that's kind of the vibe. And you sit in the Eames chair, and you, you know, you talk about your feelings. And the stereotypical question is, well, how do I? How are you feeling today? You know. Um, and for me, I'm really passionate about trying to change that narrative and make therapy something that is more down to earth and approachable. You know, showing up in sneakers, not really wearing cardigans, and <laughs> asking the that stereotypical <laughs> question. Um, but at the same time, trying to really show that, you know, who we are outside of, like, our identities aren't just our careers, right? Like, a lot of these people here I've connected with through sneakers, you know, and because of sneakers, that was kind of like the vehicle or the gateway to having these deeper conversations, you know, with Jamerson, like, we actually did a project a year ago where, you know, sneakers led us to that point. But I think whether it's sneakers, whether it's fashion, whether it's you know, beauty, I don't know, whatever, plants, like, those are vehicles and gateways to these deeper conversations. And I think, like, as a therapist, we should be figuring out ways to think outside of the box and make those conversations more approachable. So that's now what drives me to continue. I love that. You know, and to kind of wrap it all home here on, around the theme of therapy, I'm curious to know for, like, the viewers and audience who are watching this today, what advice would you share to them who are contemplating Right, where 
again, therapy wasn't in our communities. It was something that growing up, we go see a therapist or, you know, oh, you gotta be mean, you gotta be strong, don't cry, you know, show no emotion, right? Like all of these other things weren't really amplified in our households. So for, for those who are watching this today, what advice would you share to them who kind of are on the edge of seeking a therapist, not, not knowing where to start? Um, I'm curious to know, what, what are your thoughts around that? I'd, uh, I'd tell them to uh, see therapy as a uh, pre-covery and not recovery. We were talking about it earlier. Like I've done therapy on my own. I've done couples therapy, uh, you know, and, and I feel like when we, when me and my fiance did couples therapy, it was recovery, you know, like the, the issues were already there and we did not have the tools. We could not sit, sit together and have certain conversations. And I wish we would have done that uh, we would have gone to couples therapy before those issues had started. Uh, so advice that I would give everyone is just try it. You know, like the, the worst thing that you can do is not like it. And then you don't go back, you know, and shop around. You know, I, I, I like my first therapist was a six year old white guy. Um, and we did not connect at all. Like I felt like I was explaining Dominican culture to him and like, oh, why would your dad do that? Or why would your mom do that? And I was like, all right, cool, this is not the fit because we just spent 30 minutes me trying to explain cultural norms, you know? And then I found a Dominican in Trinidad. He was half Dominican, half Trinidadian, and we understood each other off rip, you know? It was like, we connected it. It almost felt like a friendship and he, he had to constantly remind me like, yo, I'm not your friend, you know? Like, <laughs> I'm, here to, like I'm not pulling up to your run, you know? Like we're not, we're not grabbing drinks on a Friday. Like, not yeah, bro, 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 bro. <laughs> Wait, yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing on Monday? He's like, no, nah, bro, I'm not. I'm not chilling with you. But you know, like, just try it, cause the like, it's, you know, the hood will tell you like, yo, why are you going to therapy? Like, you soft, you know. And it's like that was my my mindset. Like, if I go to therapy, it makes me less of a man. You know, if I go to therapy, I'm broken. Um, and then I went and I was like, oh, this is, like, this is like a conversation that I have with my friends, just that this person is equipped to give me the right advice. You know, your parent is not your therapist. Your barber is not your therapist. Your fiance, your partner is not your therapist. Everyone that you go to with those problems gives you solutions it, from their POV. You know, my mom wants what's best for me from my mom's point of view. My fiance wants what's best for me from my fiance's point of view. My barber just wants to get paid and wants me out the chair, <laughs> you know? So going to that therapist and, 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 and pouring your heart out and, and to the right person, that person has nothing to gain from your well-being. You know, they're, they're giving you their unbiased uh, professional opinion. So, you know, that would be my advice. Just try it. Shop around. I feel like uh, therapy is like dating until yeah. you find the right until you find the right uh, the right fit. It's like, all right, cool. You try it out for a week. It doesn't work. Find someone else. I think similar in my experience to a lot of the questions I kept asking myself was, why me? Why am I going through this? Like, you, we're all unique as individuals. Yes, we all have our different journeys in life. But I think something that is so common within all of us is that there is the help that we can find through therapy and the right resources and tools that we're given through therapy. And that would be probably my only advice to give somebody to start therapy. Like you're unique, yes, but we all need help. We all need some type of unbiased guidance when it comes to tapping into those problems that your barber might not know how to deal with, your fiance, your mom, your best friend. I usually tell clients or potential clients that We'll go to the gym for our physical health and therapy is essentially exercise for our mental health, you know, and it kind of makes it a little bit more concrete to that degree. Um, and also like mental health is all of our emotions. It's not just the icky, uncomfortable, yucky ones we don't really like to feel. It's also when we're really excited, when things are going well, you know, we talk to clients in therapy about like celebrating the victories, recognizing the highs and making sure that we're pausing and reflecting on those key moments as well as how we can use that to, you know, help us in the times where things aren't going as well. Um, but yeah, I agree with all, everyone. Shop around for your therapist. It is, I don't, it's not talked about enough. Schedule multiple consultations, ask them questions. You're interviewing them more than they're interviewing you. They're the person that you want to feel the most comfortable talking to about some things and be vulnerable with. So make sure you feel comfortable with them. And I also would say that 
do your research, ask around on like different therapy models. You know, there's so many models and it's so confusing to even try and navigate like, is it psychodynamic? Do I want CBT? Do I want DBT? Do I need couples therapy, family therapy? There's so many, EMDR, like so many different modalities that are all helpful for very different things. You know, so I think like during those consultations, try and be as forthcoming as you can with your therapist to let them know like what it is that you're struggling with. And you know, uh, you might outgrow them, but at that point in time, whatever you need, they'll be able to honestly say like, I'm trained in a model that will work for you or will not work for you. It can at least direct you in the right direction. And you know, eventually you might outgrow them and you might need someone in a different modality and that's totally okay too. Um, but just try not to ghost your therapist because it really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Easy plug there. Um, uh, oh, I was saying one okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, also, if you're nervous, or don't know where to start looking, ask your friends. So I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. everybody has somebody in their friend circle who knows a therapist. A lot of my friends have asked me who is my therapist, and a lot of my friends end up going to my therapist. They're like, oh, she's great. You know, so I, mean, I think like even just asking somebody who they see and just passing that information along may help them on their journey to feel confident. And then if they know that, you know, if they from the same walk of life, same patterns and things like that, like, hey, this person for me was like, I need somebody who's African American who understood, like Heck said, like, I need somebody who understands the dynamic of, of my life. Like I can't have somebody that's detached, so maybe if they're in the same kind of vein as you, hey, check out this person, and then sometimes it'll work. So ask your friends. Ask your friends around you, in your circle, and if they don't go, maybe you'll be the first person to break that in the group of your friends that, hey, we all should probably go to this. Yeah, <laughs> once you get that one in, it's, it's, it's funny because my friend actually started, he's like, yo, he cared for me so much that he, he was like, no, I, I need you to go, bro, and this is why you need to go. And he just kind of gave me a list of just the pros. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm just step on, uh, take a step into it. And I never look back, you know? And Jamerson, you touched on very important key. It was just like asking your friends, community, right? Because I think you can't, you can't do this alone. You need to try behind you. You need to create space like the one we're creating to have conversations like this to remind ourselves that we're not alone, right? Um, I'm curious to know, like, why is that so important for us? Like, why is that so important for us to get together in a huddle like this to just talk about it? One of my best friends, she's an anthropologist, and she always constantly reminds me, we come from tribes, we come from herds, we come from ancient times where as communities and as groups, we do things together and we prosper together. And it's really silly of us to think that we can succeed on our own and by ourselves. Yes, we have like celebrities that are one person, we see a, a role model, it's one person, but the team and tribe behind a very successful person is probably one of the greatest parts of why a person is successful. And these conversations are church therapy for us. They're, there's so much, so many elements, so many layers that we can peel back as an onion. And I don't think we fully see our full potential unless we're in groups that we can cultivate and relate to one another. Yeah. I think that um, to speak to people who have been in like toxic relationships and have had toxic friendships and experiences. I know that, again, in our society, uh, where people, some people feel like, I'm just by myself, I don't trust nobody, I can't be with nobody. I've dabbled into that feeling at some point too when I've been really hurt and, and I thought like, you know what, no one really cares that much about you or people care to a degree or an extent or whatever. And then I realized and I came back like, wait, no, that's a lie. And I also think like the more you learn yourself, you start to attract people based off of your values and your interests and like life can be so beautiful because like you never know who you'll meet tomorrow. That goes for love, that goes for friendship. Like the reality is like, we do need people. I think the pandemic also showed us that like, you know, you were calling people that you normally wouldn't call or you were speaking longer and things like that. And like those moments when you have a great time out with friends, I think there's like this tweet that goes around about like, um, that healed me. Like having a good friend hang out with your friends is like, it healed me is exactly what I needed today. Um, or being with family or whatever the case is, it's like, or even if it's like joining a volleyball team and like your volleyball uh, teammates make you feel really good, that's community. So even if it's not like an everyday best friend, like community is just so important because it, it can heal you in ways that you don't even realize or don't even know until you experience it and feel it, so. And it's important, like she said, knowing yourself. And like for me, it's like I'm I'm at the point where I just tell my friends, "Hey, I need y'all." <laughs> like it's, it's it's no more sugarcoating or being afraid to ask. Like I was hitting the group chat, like, "Hey, feeling down? Like, who got some time this week? Y'all want to play 2K? Y'all want to pull up? Y'all want to grab food? Y'all want to kick it? Like it's just sounding like, yo, I need I need y'all. 
Like, this life isn't meant for us to be, to, to be lived alone, like, especially the battles and the things we face every day in our own minds and our own spirits and our own hearts. Like, it's really hard to do that. And like you said, like, who said that? Which one said, like, hey, like, friends is healing. Like, being out with your friends is like, it is. Like, yo, having people who know you, who love you come over and just sharing the activity with you does leaps and bounds. And me and my lady were just talking about that because she moved and she's like going through that, like getting new friends and like leaving her friends and getting new ones. It's like, man, her friends was in town. She's like, yo, I feel so good. Like I was just able to be with people who loved me for a couple of days and it changed, you know, her entire mood. So when we, I want my boys, we've been through life together, like seven, eight years of life being broke and working in retail together down in Reed space and then seeing each other rise. So like we know the ins and outs of each other's lives, like to the T. So like they know like, oh, he ain't good. Let me go and pull up. So I know he, if he asking me, I know he really need me or they'll call me or they'll come by or like, yo, let's go here and come drag me out the house. So it's really important to have a tribe and have good friends. To add to what Jamerson said, like shared experience and common struggles, what builds community. Um, and in my opinion, like social isolation is like one of the biggest detriments to, to like just mental health. Um, we think of the pandemic. Uh, and we think of just like life in general, you know, I, that's, that's why I started We Run Up Town. You know, I was like, I had completely socially isolated myself from the world. Um, and now I rely on my community, you know, it's, uh, we've been doing it for nice. 10 years. And during the pandemic, I realized how much of an impact just not only running, but the community portion of We Run Up Town had for the people that came because we had to shut down the same way that the world shut down. And people were like DMing me or texting me like, yo, can we please start this again? Because this is the only kind of like social activity I do during the week. You know, we, we, we meet every single Monday consistently, rain, sleet, hail or snow, and people come out. And they're not, running is almost an afterthought. People are coming out to, to see their friends, you know? It's like, it's that one day of the week that you know people will be there uh, no matter what's happening in the world. Um, and, and like for me at least, it started, that's why I started it. I needed to be surrounded by like-minded individuals. And just like you're saying, like, you know, sometimes I don't wanna be there, like, but I know that if I show up, I will, I'm gonna feel a lot better. When, before the run starts, I ask everyone, like, who else had a crappy Monday? You know, the reason that we picked Monday is because Monday is a hard day of the week. Whether you're going to school, like, damn, I have to wake up to go to school. Whether you're going to work, no matter what kind of weekend you had, you could have had the best weekend in the world or the worst, the worst weekend in the world. It's business as usual Monday morning. So we meet at Monday, we meet Monday night to, 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 to combat those Monday blues, you know? Um, but I love that. Wow. You know, as, as we kind of wrap up here and stuff, um, the one thing that I want all of us to kind of take away or to, to give the audience is legacy, right? Because I think we're creating legacy right now. Um, we're breaking through the generational trauma. We're maybe the first in our families to lean into a new space. And there might be young ones out there, anybody who's watching this that sees you and says, oh wow, Jameson, I actually relate to you, or Valentino, so on and so forth, right? And that's why it's so important to have these conversations, right? So as we think about legacy and think about the conversation today or just your own individual journey, what do you want people to take away from your story? And what's the legacy you hope to leave behind? I have two kids at home, you know, I have a eight year old and a seven year old and they are my motivation, you know, and, and I selfishly get to say that because everyone doesn't have kids, but like that is my, my North Star. Whenever anything goes wrong, I'm like, all right, cool. I need to be good because if I'm not good, Hector and Hendrix aren't going to be good, you know. Um, I, we were at the spiritual uh, uh, art show the other day and uh, the, the artist that was showing said, you can't bless others until you've blessed yourself. Um, and that's like stuck with me, you know, like the boys ask me, like, Yo, are you good? And I always have to put that front on, like, yeah, I'm good, even if I'm not, just because I, and, and, and that's something that I'm trying to work on, you know, showing them that it's okay to not be good. You know, I don't have to be this big macho dad all the time. Like, no, dad's upset right now. Dad had a hard day at work because that allows them to also be able to tell me that they had a, a bad day at work, you know? So when I think of legacy, I think of my children, you know? I want them to see me and see like all the trials and tribulations that I go through and, and, and how hard it is for me to train for a marathon or, or how hard I have to work to get where I'm at in life so they can also wanna continue in my footsteps. Cause that's what I do, you know? Like I think of my dad and him coming here as, a, as an immigrant and not speaking the language and having to leave his career that he strived to, to, to achieve in the Dominican Republic to give me a better life. And 
our parents had, our parents did the best they could with what they had. We get to do the best we, just the best we can, you know? Like, we don't have those obstacles that they had to jump through, you know? We don't have to go through those hoops, you know? I, I'm, I speak the language. I was born here, I was born and raised in, in New York City. So that's the, when I think of legacy, that's what I wanna pass down to my kids. I think in terms of like my legacy, what I want people to get from me and what I want to leave behind is someone that decided to embrace and own their story, whatever that may look like, and really just to encouraging people to kind of feel good about their lives, like whatever that looks like to you, and like being the main character of your own story and like loving it and hating it and just embracing all of it. So that's the legacy I would like to leave behind. For me, I want to leave a legacy of fruitfulness. Like, while I'm still on this earth and when I leave, I want people to look back at like my life and my career and things and be able to grab stuff from the tree. Like, yo, I know this is good fruit. It's good fruit and bad fruit. I want them to grab good fruit. Like, hey, this is how he ran his career. This is, you know, what I can take from him. This is how he went, went through his triumphs, you know, through his struggles. Like, I try to be open on my social media and with people about the things I go through, but not too open to where it's like my, all my personal life is out there. But I want people to be able to grow from, from my life, not just consume it in a manner that's like, oh, we did a bunch of cool stuff, cool, but at the end of the day, it didn't help nobody. Like, what inward parts of my life did I reveal to other people so that they can be healed, that they can have more, that, that they can know that, hey, you know, there's, there's hope in the situation that I'm going through. So for me, it would be a legacy of fruitfulness. I love that. Yeah. I love that, too. Especially when, with today, there's a lot of conversation around, like, relatability on social media. And I think it's not just about, like, the superficial aspects of it. It's like how we are as human beings. I think, you know, it ties in with like my legacy is I want to leave is the fact that I own the multifaceted aspects of my life. You know, I'm not just a therapist. I'm an influencer as well. I'm a, you know, a daughter. I'm a wife. I'm a dog mom, you know, and <laughs> I yeah. played basketball. Like I, all these other things and, and it, you know, within therapy world it's kind of you know there's a stigma around like being a therapist with a public platform and kind of pulling that curtain back and letting people see who you are as a human and I just kind of jumped in head first it took me a while but that's the legacy I want to leave is that we can own all those facets of our identity and, and be okay with it and um, I think that's also trying to make therapy and therapists a little bit more relatable and down to earth so that's what I hope to leave behind. I, I've questioned this a lot within myself and with my therapist lately because I specifically advocate for undocumented immigrants and their path to citizenship like we were talking earlier. And I think my legacy is really focused on that conversation and understanding that there's going to be a lot of forces for undocumented immigrants that are working against them and working against the conversation that you're in this box and this is the box that you belong in and the world is is going to tell you a lot of times that you cannot step outside of that box and there's not going to be opportunities for you um, at all and the legacy that i'm working towards is having people understand within the undocumented community that i'm a fruitful representation of also the multifaceted things that i bring to the table and that you can also do it no matter what background you're coming from it's interesting because when I think, like, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily legacy, but I want to say to anybody out there that it's coming from another country that, like, the American dream is still there. And I, I guess growing up, I had to prove that, not to, originally my parents, but then to myself. So growing up, immigrant, my parents came, they were doctor and engineer in the Philippines, and now they're working at an egg factory in Georgia. Now that changed, my mom's now a nurse, very typical of a Filipino culture. But then here I am outside of that, where I'm in a creative marketing field. I'm, you know, of Filipino, I'm Southeast Asian descent. I'm married, I have a child, all those things that when I was growing, people are like, well, you're not gonna be able to have any of that. And I changed that norm. And I changed that norm when I talk to people that are like, well, I'm just gonna go to nursing, which I respect nursing 100%, but if that's not your passion, then you gotta follow your passion. I think the money will come. And the legacy that I leave, especially with my daughter, is you know, follow your passion, be a nice person, live your true life. Um, th that's what I hope. But I think that the American dream is still alive. 
And for those that might have an ill taste or bad taste in their mouth with all the politics happening and everything that's not good, they're still good. And you can still, in this country, as much as there's challenges, still make a difference and be your like true self. And there is so much opportunity. So that, that's what I would hope I would leave. I love that. And thank you for just bringing it all home, right? And as we wrap up here, um, I want to talk about the last thing about resources, right? Um, this is the I Am Project. We talk about mental health. We talk about self-love, building the community. You know, what are some of the resources, outlets that for those watching today who may not necessarily be in the space of therapy or other outlets, how can they get started? What are some of those resources that, you know, you guys wanted to share? Yeah, I'll start off um, for undocumented immigrants, unitedwedream.org is a great organization that not only gives you resources for understanding your process in this country as an immigrant, but also for resources to address your mental health and anything within the self that you can, that you're going through, they offer help for that. And I also use betterhelp.com for my personal therapy sessions. <laughs> Yeah, for finding a therapist, um, that's something we talked about before, is trying to find someone who's a good fit. Um, so there's platforms, called, there's well, different ones, but Alma is a great resource. Um, Headway is another good one. Um, Mental Health Match, um, Inclusive Therapists, they all have services on their websites that will actually match you with a therapist that's a good fit for you, or that at least has you know, training and experience in what you're looking for. Um, you can also filter and search their databases of therapists, so it's essentially like a, a community that we pay a membership to be a part of and be on their database, but you can search by insurance, you can search by age, gender, race, you name it, and it will help you find that person that you're looking for. Um, I think that's, you know, a great tool, and I don't think a lot of people realize, because when you're trying to find a therapist, it's, it's terrifying. It's a really hard process. We don't even know where to go. Um, so I would recommend any of those resources. Also, um, you know, the Judd Foundation is an amazing nonprofit that works on improving the mental health of teens and young adults. So any Gen X, Gen Z, sorry, or Gen X, if you really want to be involved in millennials looking for resources with mental health, the Judd Foundation is great. Um, Half the Story is another nonprofit that works to improve our relationship with technology. Um, and as creators, we all have to, to some degree, have that relationship. So teaching us how to set appropriate boundaries and identify triggers when it comes to mental health and tech is another good resource. I love that. Y'all are phenomenal, seriously. And I wanna take this time to give y'all your flowers, each individual your flowers, because not only do you deserve them, but what we've shared today as we leave today and you go through all in your individual paths and this conversation lives throughout, you're creating a difference, right? And when I think about that, you are already set in the tone for the legacy to live on. And I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all's story. I appreciate it for what y'all stand for. And the fact that everybody just came individually, it felt like a reunion. And for me, there's a few that I knew, but when you lead with purpose, when you lead with passion, when you lead with love, and you have full faith that God is gonna do his thing, you create magic like this, right? So I just wanna thank y'all. I wanna give y'all flowers um, for having this conversation with me today, but also inspiring those who may be tuning in for the first time that they heard Jamerson or Valentino and Neoma and so on and so forth, right? Y'all are powerful, and I can't wait to see what's next to hold for y'all. Now, before we leave, right, I always flip it to the guests. And it won't be an off-the-cuff show if it's not flipped. Who would you give your flowers to? Um, my younger self for surviving and thriving and getting to this place now. Um, I'm proud of her. I'm giving my mom, my mother, great woman, raised me to be who I was, to be strong, to be kind, to be powerful. Um, and may she rest her soul, and I know that she is rejoicing and happy right now man so i would love to give my flowers to my mother i think i'll give them i'll definitely know i'll give them to my grandfather also rest in peace because he was the the person who saw the vision for a family of 16 people to come to this country didn't know the language um start new and 
I would just like to thank him because to be a visionary and see that far ahead, it, it's a genius type of mentality and something that I hope I can foster within me and, and see that vision for myself. Um, I would give it to my husband. So we're hitting 25 years this year. Ooh, let's go. <laughs> right. So it's just, he's, you know, 17 years old and 19. So we've evolved as adults. So I think he's been there through thick and thin, and so have I. So it goes to him. Mm. I guess I'll follow too. You know, I give my flowers to my grandmother. You know, may she also rest in peace. I feel like this is an extension of her legacy living through me. Um, she was always cultivating community, having conversations, um, being a very charismatic, joke here, joke here. Um, but I think what led and laid every room was her energy and her love. So that's who I'll give my flowers to. I'll give mine to two people. My husband, just he is literally my rock and my biggest support and the most selfless person I know. Um, and Alan Iverson. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's all you're with. He, no, I'm not even saying, like, he is literally, like, my role model and the reason why I try to do what I do within this, the therapy space because for him in the MBA, he was really the person who, you know, set the tone of showing up authentically as himself. Aside from his talent on the court, um, he owned who he was and, and took a lot of shit for it. And um, he's an icon. I'd give my flowers to my parents, collectively, both of them together. Uh, they walked so I could run. Um, I, I, I mentioned it earlier, but my parents got here in the 80s uh, and did the best that they could. And I have two amazing parents. And it wasn't until I got older and started visiting other people's houses where I was like, oh, damn, I have amazing parents. Like, your parents yeah. suck. You know, like, you know, like <laughs> and I'm That's saying it joking, but it's the truth. Like, I feel like you don't know what you have until you start to experience, like, sleep over people's houses and True. see the interaction with uh, them and their parents. And uh, I would give both my mom and my dad their flowers because had they not done everything they did, I would not be the man that I am today. I want to give my flowers to all of you for doing the work, the internal work. And if this is the first time you're listening to a conversation like this, if you're battling through anything, you have resources around you. Create a community around you, have conversations, speak about your truth, and remind yourself that you're not alone, right? Seek the advice that you need um, and know that anything is possible with community. So with that said, I appreciate y'all again for being here. Um, thanks to Brooklyn Cloth for creating a phenomenal space um, around the I Am Project because we're all powerful, we're all worthy, we're all valuable, um, and we're all building legacy. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you.